Perfect. Let's get it started. Um, and I will let people in as, as they come in. Um, welcome again to this meeting, to this Europe lunchtime uh, seminar. My name is Franco Asato, as you may know me already. Um, I am uh, the training and accreditation coordinator uh, with IRAP. And today it is my pleasure to, to introduce you to Morgan Fletcher, who you may know as well. He is uh, the Latin America and the Caribbean operations lead team um, for IRAP. And he's going to be chairing uh, the presentation uh, today. So Morgan, great to have you here. Um, let's go through the agenda um, just to be on the same page about what we are going to be speaking about. Um, we are going to start with an introduction to star rating performance tracking and the global safety per performance, sorry, target four tips for incorporating performance tracking into a project and star rating performance tracking case studies from Europe and beyond. Let's do some housekeeping, um, which is really important uh, to, man to maintain the tidiness of, of the meeting. We are going to be having a 60 minutes uh, meeting, so it's an hour. Um, while Morgan is presenting, I will ask you to direct your questions through me, um, through the chat. Um, you may have realized you don't have the ability to unmute yourselves, but there is going to be a Q&A time at the end, at which I'm going to ask you, of course, to raise your hand for every question. But of course, we want to hear from you and, and Morgan is more than happy to, to, to answer to some of your queries. Um, so that's the way we are going to be working. Uh, while Morgan speaks, uh, you can write your questions and I'm going to direct those to Morgan. And when Morgan finishes, we can have a QA and a um, space. So, well, and just keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and uh, super happy to share this recording with you after the meeting. So with all of that said, uh, Morgan, the floor is yours and I'm going to stop sharing so that you can start sharing yours. Thank you, Franco. Let me just share my screen. Let me know when you can see um, see my screen here. Not yet. How about now? Now, yes. Excellent. Okay. Well. Thanks for the introduction, Franco. As Franco mentioned, I'm the uh, operations lead for Latin America and the Caribbean. And I've been asked to do this presentation today just because in LAC, we've, we've had a bit of experience now going back to about 2015 in star rating, star rating performance tracking. So thank you all for joining. Um, I'm basically going to give you a bit of an introduction, um, go through some of the, the UN uh, Oops, sorry. Let me do this. Uh, the the UN Global Road Safety um, target set performance targets there, and then uh, basically go through some examples of of where we've used the performance uh, star rating performance tracking in in different projects around the world. Um, go through some of the tips that we've learned from that time doing the, the performance tracking um, uh, through experience, and then uh, go into detail into some of the, 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 the case studies that, uh, to give you an idea of, of what you need to look out for if you are planning to do uh, a star rating performance tracking. So it's, it's impossible to talk about the star rating performance tracking without talking about the UN Global Road Safety um, targets, performance targets here. So following a request from the World Health Assembly in 2016, the World Health Organization uh, collaborated with other UN agencies and regional commissions and the UN, uh, the UN Road Safety Collaboration to develop 12 voluntary global road safety performance targets shown here on the left. The targets included um, ensuring all roads are built to three star or better standards for all road users, target three, and and for more than 75% of travel to be on the equivalent of uh, a three-star or better road by 
2030, and that's for all users, so, and that's target four. So as far as I can see, neither of these targets can be achieved if there is no star rating uh, performance tracking. Uh, which is why it is so important and, and I guess why you're you're here today. Uh, moving on. Um, and, and if we are able to meet targets three and four by 2030, we should be able to save, <clears throat> based on our calculations, around 450,000 lives a year of the 1.3 million people that are, are killed on the road network each year. Um, and that will lead to around 100 million deaths and serious injuries prevented over 20 years. And, and I guess one thing that was, uh, I guess, missing from the, the first decade of action, uh, 2011 to 2020 for road safety was, um, was, the, was getting the funding right. And we can see, and, and it's a big um, component of the, the 2021 to 2030 decade of action is, is looking at how we can get the funding sources right. And I've included this here. So for, for every $1 invested, we're looking at savings um, to, to the community, to, to the country of, of around $8. So it's, it's not a matter of pumping all this money in. It's, it's, it's almost recalibrating where that money is going instead of going to occupying hospital beds and, and looking at post-crash care. Um, and, and losses to the economy, looking to improve the infrastructure so we can avoid those uh, costs uh, from the get-go. Um, and the, the global plan was developed again by the, the World Health Organization, the, the United Nations Regional Commissions in cooperation with the United Nations Road Safety Collaboration, um, basically as a, a, as a guiding document to support the implementation of the Decade of Action uh, 2021 to 2030 um, and, and its objectives. Um, and again, we can see here uh, the IRAP three star or minimum uh, target uh, at the heart of the, the safe system approach here um, based on this, this plan as well. So that's a bit of context. Um, so let's, let's now explore just how performance tracking um, can be used along with the, the star rating methodology and, and how that can help. And so before I get into details about what you need to consider in order to, to track star rating performance, I thought I'd share a couple of examples uh, of, of just why it's so important to track the star rating performance. So in this example from New Zealand, an engineering treatment here has essentially eliminated head-on fatal risk outcomes from the road completely. So this upgrade, it's a few years old now, so there are probably, we can say, at least um, six people alive today because of the, the, the treatment here that we've, we've put in. Um, and, and I think that's amazing. And it's, it's news worth shouting to the world, to the, to the community, to the politicians, so we can have more of the same, but at a larger scale. And communication is an essential part of reducing the road toll. We have to bring the political management, engineering and community attention to the horror of what's happening now and just show how easily it can be solved. Um, and we need to celebrate every life we save and, and use that as momentum to save the next life. And as fantastic as using crash data to track performance is, I mean, we could see here six fatal head-on crashes, three injury head-on crashes uh, in the five years prior and the four years following, no fatal head-on crashes, no injury crashes. Um, how many politicians have the luxury of waiting four or five years to celebrate such successes? So the star rating of a new road or an upgrade on the other hand, can be calculated immediately and used as a metric uh, when we're cutting the ribbons to, to open the new road. Uh, star ratings for schools uh, is another uh, example I'd quickly like to show. So star ratings for schools is a fantastic evidence-based tool for measuring managing, um, communicating the risk that children are exposed to on a journey to school. And it supports quick interventions that save lives and prevent serious injuries from day one and allows for tracking of key metrics. So here you can see the, the Safe Schools Tracker, which was developed to track the performance of star rating assessments carried out around schools. And I've got a couple of slides here, so I'll, I'll just show, I'll flick through them so you can see the comparison. So we're looking at before the upgrades happened in this slide here, and we can see that we've got approximately 
50% uh, of the road rated as one or two star. Uh, if we go to the after, we can see that basically all the road now is, is three star or better. We've only got a tiny segment of, of the road network that's one or two star. And it's not just about tracking the, the star rating. When we talk about star rating performance tracking, we can also use the methodology and use some, some KPIs um, to, to track the performance as well. So here we've got the speed limits. We can, we can use uh, different metrics as well um, that were collected or, or put together as part of a star rating project to see the, the changes that have occurred on a road network. So we can see here um, a big reduction in the speed limit and operating speed, um, an improvement in the, the sidewalks that, that around the schools. A huge one is lines and signs here. We can see that the majority of the, uh, of the assessments originally were conducted on, on roads that had poor lines and signs. Um, after the upgrades, we've got nearly all uh, roads conducted on, on sections that have um, adequate lines and signs. And, and we can use various of the, the, the attributes to, to do this type of uh, performance tracking. Um, so as I said, it's, it's not just the star rating, which, which obviously is a, the headline figure, uh, improving the star rating from two to four stars. It's, um, it's very easy to communicate that. But we can also dig deeper into things like the star rating risk scores. So for example, a 35% reduction in risk between these two examples here. Um, we can look at trauma estimates and, and model um, the, uh, the likely fatalities and serious injuries using uh, the, the star rating methodology. Here we can see where there's going to, there's likely to be uh, five fatalities and serious injuries fewer. Um, we can also use, as, a, as we've just gone through, different road attribute KPIs. For example, here um, using, using safety barriers. So there've been seven kilometers of safety barriers installed uh, between the two different designs or the two different uh, situations of the road network. Um, it's also possible to, to use some of the, the, the IRAP key performance KPIs where we've, we've basically combined speeds in particular with, with different attributes here. So where we've got uh, vulnerable road users, we're looking at the percentage of um, roads above 40 kilometers an hour that have facilities and that have safe uh, facilities for, for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, also where we've got high speed roads above 80 kilometers an hour, what's happening on the roadsides? What's happening uh, with the head on risk? So it's also possible using IRAP star rating data uh, to do these types of assessments where we, we combine certain attributes. Uh, I'll quickly just run through a couple of examples where we've done this around the world. And one of my favorite studies uh, that I always include in these presentations is, is from Mexico. Um, so the Mexican national government did an assessment of 40,000 kilometers of their road network back in 2012. And incidentally, it was one of the first projects I worked on uh, with IRAP. I moved to Mexico and, and, and worked on this project with uh, the government there. And they star rated this 40,000 kilometers of roads. And you can see in the top map here, you can see a lot of sections that are colored in one star, which is black. Uh, two star, red, orange, three star, a couple of sections that are um, four star, a bit of yellow in there. And, and maybe if you zoomed in, you'd be able to, to find a, a, a bit of five star, which is green. But, um, but by 2015, the, the network had changed enough for the government to go and, and do a reassessment of their network uh, across the same roads. What we saw was the percentage of roads rated three star or better it improved by 70%. So it'd been an improvement in the star rating, or in other words, uh, a reduction of the, the one and two star roads that we, we really try and focus on, on treating of 17%. And this didn't happen by accident. They used the IRAP results to systematically guide their investment in making uh, improvements, and then did the reassessment to to track their performance and also use that as a baseline for the, the next assessment going forward. And this is one example on the highway that was improved, um, uh, of the, the highway network that was improved. And, and this is between Querétaro and Irapuato in Mexico. And it's a road that's about 95 kilometers long. Uh, in 2012, only 10% was rated three star or better. 
So to put that another way, 90% of the road uh, was rated one or two stars. By 2015, through investment in safer infrastructure, the government lifted the percentage of road rated three star or better to about 89%. So you can see some of the things they did was to put in safety barriers on both sides um, of the road. But if you also look closely uh, in the second image here, you'll be able to see rumble strips along the edge line. And, and these really um, help to reduce the risk of, of runoff crashes. So they lifted the road network from 90%, one and two star, to almost 90%, three or star or better. And what they saw in the years following was a 52% reduction in fatalities on this section of road. So it's a really substantial improvement. Uh, by doing um, treatments or uh, implementing treatments, that are not necessarily the most sophisticated, uh, the, the rumble strips in particular, um, but just using proven and, and, and very affordable treatments in a, in a targeted way and using star rating data to track the impact. So I guess from the last quick few examples that I've just shown, we, get, we can see that the objective of star rating performance trackings are to track road safety performance and monitor policy positions and to better understand the nature of road, I mean, in particular, speed-related risk over time. Um, to do performance tracking effectively and to enable comparisons and tracking, there, there really needs to be a control uh, and alignment between the original and new coding data sets. We need to compare apples with apples, and, and this, uh, can be quite complicated if you, if you don't get it right from the beginning. And we'll talk about that in a bit more uh, detail going forward. Um, the star rating models are, are quite complex models, which produce results at uh, 100 meter segments. And in some cases use smoothing rules to produce results over longer road sections. Um, and I wanted to show this example here just to, to give you an idea of what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about here. Um, We've got here two different assessments of the same road. Um, so if we look at the, the green uh, alignment here, we can see that the first assessment was done along the green alignment. And then we've gone back and, and um, done a reassessment of the road. And you can see that here um, using uh, the, the red markers. Uh, so I wanted to include this just to give you an idea of, of how important it is to try and track and match these GPS points. Um, what can happen uh, if you do assessments and, and they're not well matched is that you might include, uh, for example, an intersection, the coding of the intersection in 100 meter stretch in one assessment and in a different 100 meter stretch in, in the following assessment. And where we have this mismatch, it, it's very hard to, to do assessments, uh, gran really granular assessments. It still works well for for assessments of the, the network as a whole. But if we want to compare um, this data at a, at a granular level, it's really important to spend the time early on to try and match as well as you can um, these, the, the, the GPS locations of the two, um, the two different assessments. So just a couple of the considerations here, uh, if you are doing or looking to do performance tracking using the IRAP star rating. Uh, methodology. Um, so things to consider. So for example, is the coding team or is the software the same for both, both assessments? Why is this important? So if, if we've got the same coding team and the same software, it might be, might be possible. And instead of doing two unique assessments of the road network to incorporate the, the coding of the original assessment uh, and to look at where that's changed. So you can use the, the baseline coding and basically go through and, and code uh, differences in the network where things have improved or deteriorated over time. Um, and, and that allows you to get really good results and use them at a, a granular level. Uh, is the coding team the same? There, there might be things that were picked up during the first coding team, um, sorry, the first the coding exercise. Uh, and if you're using the same team to do the coding, uh, that uh, ability or, or that knowledge of the network um, 
is going to, to remain in the assessment. So, and you'll have a really good understanding of, of the results if you can uh, match that up. It doesn't mean that it, it's impossible to do without, but it, it does help if you've got a good understanding of, of the original coding before you go through and, and do the coding of the reassessment. Um, was the same version of the IRAP model used? We've had examples where uh, we're trying to compare star rating results that were collected in 2010 with, using um, IRAP tools, the, the previous version of the IRAP model with results in VITA. And, and that was quite tricky. And we'll, we'll go through that in the example going forward um, as to some of the, the, the learning uh, that came out of that one. Um, can you revisit the original coding? Uh, Essentially, it's, it's important to be able to match start and end points. It's also important to, to have an understanding of, of what assumptions were made in the original um, in the original coding. So things like speed and, and, and vehicle flows, if, if they were estimated in the original coding and you've gone through and collected good quality um, data in the, in the new coding, we need to understand whether changes in the star rating have occurred because um, because the infrastructure has changed or because some of the, the baseline assumptions uh, have changed. So th there could be the opportunity if we need to go back and make some changes to the original coding to allow us to, to do a better comparison um, to see if that's possible. So can the coding software be modified to, to match locations between assessments? And I've included this one here because this was done uh, in, the, in the Mexico example that I've, I've showed and we'll, we'll talk about in more detail going forward. Um, the, the, the coding team, CEMIC in Mexico, took the time to modify their coding software to allow them to really match those GPS locations between the two assessments before they got going. Uh, and it, it took a bit of time at the beginning, but it, it really helped with the uh, with a performance tracking and it, it actually saved them time in the long run. So has the assessed network changed significantly? And, and I'm not talking about minor changes here. I'm talking about, for example, duplications or, or new roads. Um, obviously, uh, you, as you're aware that the star rating model requires you to do assessments of, of each carriageway. So if we've got a single carriage road, it's, um, it's assessed in one direction. If we've got dual carriageway roads, uh, it, it has to be assessed in both of the two uh, directions of traffic. So if, there be, if the road's been duplicated, um, we need to know about that so we can uh, make sure we're assessing the same network between the two, uh, the two um, studies. Um, what smoothing type was included in the original assessment? And, and this mightn't sound like much, but it can really make a difference if we're trying to compare um, sections of road, homogeneous sections of road between two different assessments, knowing the smoothing type that was used, whether it was smoothed by section or by length of the original survey can make a huge difference. And you might actually need to go back and change the smoothing type of the original uh, in order to allow you to, to have a better comparison uh, of the, the reassessment. Were the roads assessed in the same direction? Uh, and this is where it pays to to really understand the data of the original survey before you go out and start uh, assessing um, uh, the road again. So we've had situations where we've, we've had a road that was surveyed from point A to B in the original um, baseline survey. And then we got um, image data given to us and, and asked to do a reassessment. But in the, the reassessment case, uh, the roads were assessed from from B to A essentially. So trying to do these comparisons when the road was assessed in the opposite direction, it's possible, but it does require an extra uh, lot of work. And that could be simplified a lot if, if we knew that we were going to be doing a, a, a performance tracking uh, study uh, before we went out and, and, and did the reassessment. So if you are going to do an assessment of a road network, it, it does pay to, to look to see if the if the road was already assessed previously and if you will be required to do a comparison of the data because it, it may, may change how you do your uh, your survey of the, the road network. Can start and end points of the of the road be matched? Um, this allows you to to make sure, as I said, you, you're comparing the same segments of the road network and it helps you match up those hundred meter points very well. And importantly. Uh, how are operating speeds and flows calculated in the original assessment? 
and have assumptions around these or, or have uh, collection methods change between the two assessments. So we want to make sure that the performance tracking we're doing, we're actually assessing changes to the infrastructure and not changes to, to assumptions. Uh, and that's a really key uh, take from all of the, the different projects that we've worked on. It's, it's to make sure that we are comparing apples with apples and we don't want to essentially do a reassessment and and look at uh, a network where we've we've taken data from the original survey which uh, let's assume that the speed limit was 100 and we and there was an assumption that they um or we've been given data to say that the, the operating speed was 110 and then we do a reassessment and we go out and collect good quality speed data and we find that uh it, now that the operating speed is 120, we need to understand whether that's a difference um, that has occurred, and it may well have uh, occurred. Uh, increases in speed limit can occur, particularly after upgrades to roads and, and upgrades to the pavement quality. Uh, we need to understand if that was a change that has occurred, or if this was just a, an assumption that was made in the, in the beginning that needs to be revisited. Uh, and again, similar thing with the vulnerable road users of peak hour flows. Were they, how are they estimated? We need to make sure that we're using a similar approach to make sure that we, we are comparing apples with apples. Uh, so these are some really key considerations and some learnings that we've, 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 uh, we've taken from the different uh, star rating performance tracking projects that we've worked on uh, going, going forward. Uh, Going forward, it, it, it's important um, to, to take some of these on board and, and we'll, we'll see uh, in the next slides uh, a few more examples. So, so why might star ratings change over time? Um, they can be because of improvements to the road infrastructure. Uh, we can see here the second one, deteriorations to the road infrastructure. So this was a, an assessment in the Pacific corridor of Central America. And we had some feedback saying, oh, why is my star rating going down? So we went and had a look and we could actually see that a road that was assessed back in 2010, um, basically a brand new service that hadn't done much maintenance uh, in the years following. And we had some de deterioration to the road um, infrastructure. So we were able to, to go back and explain and using the, the star rating performance tracking and say, uh, look, you had a three-star road you know, originally, and, and that's now dropped to a two-star road based on, on some deteriorations and some lack of maintenance of the road uh, infrastructure in the pavement. Um, they can change because of changes to the surrounding environment, for example, heads and bikes and, and land use. Um, traffic growth can be, can be a, a reason that, that the star ratings may change. And, and again, as I've, I've explained, uh, operating speeds can also be uh, a key reason why you might have differences in the star ratings. And when we're looking at, at data management, uh, and here I'm talking about knowing your data. So start planning the performance tracking before the resurvey begins. It's, it's one of the key tips uh, that I'd take from this presentation. Seek out and explore the data from the original assessment if your organization or if you weren't involved in the first the baseline assessment and, and try and understand uh, the, the assumptions that were made and, and how the coding was done. And, and as much as you can uh, from that first assessment and it will make your life easier as you're doing a reassessment and really take the time to understand both sets of coding data. Uh, and, and why do we need to do that? We don't want to get to the end of a project, produce the results, and have results that we can't explain. We, we, if we have some results, for example, improvements in star ratings or, or even um, uh, sections that have gone from, from a higher star rating to a lower star rating, we, we need to understand why they have varied. Can we explain them to the client? And do they make sense? And if they don't, we need to dig in and, and try and find out um, um, what needs to change um, or, or try and understand why they're uh that they're the way they are um so i wanted to jump in now to a couple of examples so i wanted to uh go back to look at the the, the mexico example that i shared earlier 
And just to explain um, how we, we achieve those results. So revisiting the, the, uh, the study that we looked at earlier, uh, the 2012 to 2015 in, in Mexico, one of the key objectives here obviously was to, to make a compa comparison of the star rating. And, and we've, as we've already seen, uh, the study highlighted that the percentage of road rated one and two stars um, reduced by 20% or so. There was an improvement uh, in the roads rated three, three star or better of, of 17%. But I wanted to dig a little deeper here into the task that were involved in preparing this type of comparison between 2012 and 2015. And um, unfortunately with one hour, we're not going to be able to explain everything, but I wanted to, to share a few key points from this. And one of the really neat tools that the, the team conducting the performance tracking developed in this project uh, was a software or a modification to their coding software that allowed uh, the coders to compare both the attribute coding data and the image data at 100 meter intervals along the network. And we can see here, uh, as you move along the map here, both dots change and you can see uh, where, uh, where see the images from both surveys. So you can see where infrastructure has changed and where the infrastructure uh, has a change or it's deteriorated because of a, a lack of maintenance. So this type of bespoke software allowed the, the in-depth analysis and allowed CEMIC, the, the company that undertook it, to identify changes in the network that caused by, as I said, improvements, the road infrastructure, um, as you can see here in this photo, um, deteriorations from damage to the infrastructure, damages to, to for example, barriers um, or a lack of maintenance of the, the line markings or, or road, road pavement, um, changes to the surrounding environment, changes to, to traffic, um, traffic growth or where the results were, uh, different interpretation, interpretations of the, sorry, interpretations of the coding manual between 2012 and 2015. Um, and it, and it even allowed us to identify where there were different or slight mismatches between start and end points for each of the 100 meter sections causing um, causing differences in the star ratings at the really granular 100 meter level, for example, where intersections may have shifted from one 100 meter stretch of road to the next um, based on the start and end points of, of the IRAP assessment. Um, so this project was really well received by the client and it demonstrated how a thorough understanding of both sets of data uh, was key to understanding why star rating results might vary over time. Another example I wanted to share was a, a Pacific corridor assessment <clears throat> uh, in, in Central America. And this assessment was a bit different because we were asked to, to compare 2010 uh, data collected with version 2.2 of the R star rating model, which had 50 attributes with um, the, the 2018 3.02 version of the R model, which has, as you're aware, 78 attributes. And this is about 2,300 kilometers that we're asked to assess. Uh, with this assessment, we weren't involved in the, the, the reassessment of the road. We weren't involved with the inspection uh, in 2018. We were given data and, and told, are you able to do a, a star rating performance tracking of this um, and compare it against the 2010 data? And this was the example that I mentioned earlier where the data was actually collected in opposite directions. And if I could recommend one thing, uh, it would be if you are doing a rare service, please try and make the, uh, the road inspection occur in the same direction, particularly on on single carriageway roads, um, uh, as was undertaken in the original baseline assessment. It, it will really make your life easier if you don't have to try and convert the data and turn it around uh, to make the comparison. What we found in this project, uh, and, and here's a, a little tool that I came up with um, to try and match GPS points from, here's the, the data we've got on the left-hand side here from the, the 2010 study or assessment. Um, and, and I came up with this little tool in, in Excel. So I'm, I'm no expert. I'm sure it can be done uh, a lot better, but I came up with this tool to match the latitudes and longitudes 
and to find the closest point between the two um, surveys and to, to find the distance um, between the two. And this tool really helped us um, to, it saved us a lot of time I mean, in the long run, matching the, the start and end points of each of the, the road sections uh, to try and do the, the performance tracking um, uh, as best we could at a, at a granular level. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, the, the surveys being conducted in the opposite direction made it really tough. What we found in this assessment or in this performance tracking um, study that we did was with the differences in models, the, the, we needed to make quite a few assumptions as to the, the um, different attributes that were coded in 2018 that, that weren't in the model in 2010. Um, it meant that it, the star rating, the headline star rating figures um, were, were based on a lot of assumptions. So what we found was probably more important in this case was to dig down and to look at some of the different KPIs that had changed and look at some of the attributes that were um, coded in both assessments to look at uh, how the infrastructure had changed and how we could use that data uh, um, to make this, uh, this comparison. So for example, we could see um, the number of divided carriageways had increased, almost doubled over the, the space of the eight years, which is a big improvement. Um, we could, we could also see the number of two lane roads had improved, uh, um, barriers and, and roadside uh, objects had gotten somewhat safer. We could see here that there was hardly any uh, barriers coded in the 2010 assessment and that had gone up to most 250 kilometers um, by 2018. And, and we've got a couple of here highlighted in red because the 2010 model didn't collect um, barrier terminals. So uh, there are a few things that, that didn't match up 100%, but we could see here um, the number of roundabouts had increased. So really trying to understand what, uh, what you're trying to achieve and, and, and how best to achieve it, whether it's with the star ratings themselves or whether it's with road attribute KPIs um, is, is a, a really important takeaway from this project. Um, and again, from this assessment, uh, we could we could dig down and, and using the GPS match software, we could actually identify different changes um, at certain locations. So here we can see the, the star rating risk worms, uh, which identifies risk as we go along the, the road network uh, for, for a certain section. And, and we could dig in here. We, we got some feedback saying, no, my road's improved. How, could, how dare you say that it's, that it's gotten worse? And we're able to identify the same spots or the same location between the two assessments and say, well, when we conducted the original survey, you had a, a very good pavement quality. You had your signs and lines, the, the, the delineation was excellent. Um, well, it was adequate. Uh, and then we went back, there hadn't been any maintenance done. And, and that's why you've, you've actually got a, a lower star rating in the reassessment than you had in the original, uh, in the original assessment done back in 2010. Um, another example I wanted to share here was a project that I worked on in Chile. Uh, it was a, for an access road to a BHP mine, the biggest copper mine in the world. Uh, and, and BHP asked us to do an assessment from the port city of Antofagasta all the way through to their mine site up in um, Minera Escondida. So instead of treating the two assessments or the three assessments in this case uh, as, as individual uh, assessments. What I did here is I, before I went and did the reassessment, I took the data and, and this was comparing particularly the 2019 and 2020 assessments. I took the, the coded data from the original and was able to put that back into the coding software. Uh, and knowing how to match the GPS locations, I was able to use the, the baseline coded data um, and simply make changes. Or you, well, when I was doing the reassessment, to go back and change differences in the coding. And using our, our knowledge of the, the road network, we knew the only changes that had occurred, uh, the only improvements to the road network was a section right up in the mountains called uh, uh, 
where they had a, a lot of curves and a lot of one and two star roads. So we knew that that's where they were focusing their in inspections on. So going through um, and using the baseline assessment as, as the basis for the, the coding of the, the reassessment allowed me to, or allowed us to, to save a lot of time when it came to coding uh, the stretches of road that we weren't likely to see improvements. We, we, we did come across some sections that uh, had deteriorated and that was picked up in the, the star ratings, but uh, it allowed us to save quite a bit of time when it came to the, the, the coding of the, the reassessment. Um, and if it is possible, that is a, a takeaway that I take from this session is to, where possible, use the the coded data from the original assessment as a basis for the coding of the reassessment. So you're not starting with a blank canvas. You've actually got coded data that you're you're essentially just coding differences to. Uh, and that that really uh, was a, a help when we came to to um, to doing the performance tracking and putting that into a report to show the differences. We could then go back and say, because the, the start and end points of each hundred meters stretch were identical. We could, we could show at a hundred meter level um, differences in the, the star rating and what caused them. Um, the, the last uh, example here that I wanted to, to run through before we, we get into some questions uh, was from, from Brazil. And this is um, looking at how star rating performance tracking has been incorporated into the concessioning of roads uh, in Brazil. And we're starting to see this elsewhere, but it, it's really taken off in Brazil, where there are a lot of concessions happening. Uh, road toll roads are being incorporated into the network, and with the help of the IFC and the World Bank, um, there have been about fourteen projects so far, and it's approximately eight thousand kilometers of roads in in the states of Sao Paulo, uh, some federal highways uh, between Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and in the highways in, in Paraná as well, uh, in, in the state south of uh, Sao Paulo. And what's happening in these projects is when a road goes from being a, a public road to a concession, um, the IRAP methodology is being incorporated as a, as a metric to measure the, the level of safety. Um, and it, it's really quite interesting. So the process, of doing this because in a lot of cases, the road is being uh, turned into a toll road uh, because it requires some major improvements to the infrastructure, duplications and things like that. So they're incorporating IRA, uh, doing a baseline assessment and an assessment of the existing road and taking the, the SHRIP or the, the, the recommendations for, for improvements and matching that against the improvements that were already going to occur as part of the, the concession, uh, the concessioning of that road. So the essentially taking two sets of improvement uh, of data, looking at, at different improvements that might occur on this road and trying to match them. So the point of that is to avoid duplicity in the, in the investments and also to check to see if, if some of the, the IRAP suggestions, for example, we might suggest on a road network that you need to install a barrier on a curve because you've got a, a danger, or you might need to remove a, a hazard on a curve because you've got a, a, a dangerous hazard in, on, a, on a high speed road. The, the, the project to do the concession might already be looking at installing barriers for that entire stretch. So some of the, the IRAP treatments may no longer be required. And, and also for things like uh, improving road surface, um, in improving the pavement quality where you've got a, a road being duplicated. Some of the things that were already going into the, the project uh, that were picked up in both surveys, uh, both the IRAP assessment and the, and the concession of the road, we were able to kind of cross-reference. So that allowed us to come up with a final IRAP investment plan and, and, that, and using also the changes to the um, the, the traffic and the likely traffic assumptions and, and, and flows over the course of 20 to 30 years, we're able to come up with this type of, these type of um, scenarios. And you can see here down the, down the left-hand side, we've got different road sections. 
And we've got here on the top different years. So you can see in most cases, the, the star rating improves. We've got road sections here that were two stars, they go up to three based on, on the improvements that were going to occur uh, anyway, and also some of the IRAP, assessment, the IRAP recommendations that were included in the investment plans going forward that the, that the concession there were, was, was uh, required to undertake. But then in certain points, we've actually got a, a drop off in the star rating, and that's due to things like um, increased flows on, on the road or assumptions that the flow will increase by year 18. So I wanted to share this one uh, to show you where this is the star rating performance can, can, can get to. And, and the star rating targets in this case were used, um, were used to as a metric for the concessionaire going forward uh, to basically earn more money from their, their concession. They're able to, if they could match or beat the, the star rating assumptions or the star rating scenarios, yeah, if they could get to where we had a three star road recommended and they were able to show through assessments in year six, 10, 14, 18, that they actually had a four star or a five star road. They actually received an incentive, a monetary um, incentive um, to either match or beat the IRAP star rating. So a really novel and interesting approach or innovative approach to using the star rating performance tracking uh, going forward. Now, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll do a quick recap of, of just this presentation and, and some of the key takeaways. Then we can jump into some questions, Franco, if there are, uh, are some in the, in the chat already. Um, so takeaway one is, would be to, to start planning your performance tracking as early as possible, ideally before you go in and do a, a reassessment or reinspection of the road network. Find the best KPIs to tell your story. Uh, and, and we can look here using the star rating methodology, we can look at the overall star rating, the headline figure, and we can also dig into the, the road attribute data and, and some of the other results that, that an IRA star rating uh, assessment produces. Try and take the time to work out how to match GPS points between the two assessments. It is uh, complicated, but in the long run, if, if you're able to, to do this well, it will save you time and make your um, your the story that you're telling much easier if you can do comparisons at a granular level and and to dig in and, and find images from the original survey and find where those locations were in the reassessment um, understand the operating speeds between the the two assessment speeds are, are a key driver in the in terms of the, the star ratings so understanding how the operating speeds were collected in the original survey and, and understanding uh, how they're collected in the, the resurvey or, or how operating speeds have changed over time. It's very, very important. Um, and, and really know your data. So if, if you do have um, changes in the star rating, or even if you don't, yeah, understand if they make sense and make sure you're able to explain why you've got things. That, it, it's really not um, enough to just do two separate assessments and compare them and say, okay, We've gone from 20% three star or better to 25% without knowing the drivers of, of those changes in terms of the improvements or the reductions in star ratings. And finally, celebrate successes. It's, it's how we're going to, to keep um, the, the message of, or, the, or to achieve our, the, the UN uh, performance targets of, of three and four, uh, targets three and four, uh, and reduce the number of fatalities on our road network. So um, I'll hand back over to you now, Franco, and if there are some questions, I'll be happy to, to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan. Let me uh, share my screen again. Um, guys, uh, well, first of all, as I was saying, uh, thanks, uh, Morgan, for, for your time and, and your presentation. This is very, very important, and, and, and it would be good to, to add, just take every project with the assumption that somehow it's going to to be to be followed up in 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 time so the tidiness of your project in the beginning it's going to of course uh interact with the easiness or or the difficulty level of of doing the the, the star rating uh, performance tracking 
Um, we, we don't have questions in the chat box, uh, but we are happy um, to have you speaking and directing uh, your questions to Morgan. Um, the only thing uh, we would like is you to raise your hands so that we can do this in a, in a tidy um, way. So there in reactions, um, you, you should be seeing my screen, right? Yes, I can see. Okay, so there in reactions, you can raise your hand and I can allocate you the, the mic. No one? Okay, we have Rachel, go ahead, Rach. You should be able to speak now. Yeah, thank you so much, Frank. But thanks, Morgan. That is really, really important and really timely. Um, I appreciate this presentation. And the reason I appreciate it the most is we're about to do a post-construction assessment on nearly 500 kilometers of roads we've assessed. We assessed like three or four years ago. And one of my biggest challenges at the moment is aligning those coordinates Trying to get make sure the GPS coordinates align so that we can easily compare each hundred meters. And I wanted to ask: Is there? I'm, I'm going to use the word trick, but is there any insights or any tricks you can share with us? Because it seems like you've done this <laughs> this comparison in, on a few projects, mostly to do with comparing the video footage from the new assessment and aligning it with the coordinates. Um, I think that's where we are likely to have um, challenges at the moment, like understanding the image of then and the image of now mm. and what they align to. Did you manage to resolve that for yourself? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways. So uh, like I said, I'm no expert, but I managed to come up with a tool um, comparing GPS locations in Excel. Uh, and that, that was sufficient in order to, to find the nearest locations to match the, the start points of your 100 meter sections um, from the original survey. So then you could use that information. You could say, okay, I know that um, kilometer 3.2 from my original survey matches kilometer 4.6 from my new survey. And I was able to, to use that information to go back and, and, and enable that comparison. Um, there are better ways that it's been done. I know uh, different suppliers have been able to incorporate it into their coding software. So they're actually, um, so it's actually in the coding software and you've got access to both sets of images when you're doing the assessment. And you've got access to the original serving uh, the coding data to to show you okay uh, were the assumptions that were made in the original assessment are they still valid and has the road changed um, has it been improved have there, have there been treatments that have been implemented or has there been deterioration so um, I, I'm happy to share the the tool that I came up with uh, it's, it's very basic. Uh, in Excel, but I, I'd be happy to share that one with you uh, for your assessment. Does that answer your question, Rachel? Let me look for Rachel and because I, I think she mute herself and now she cannot unmute. Hold on. Yeah, yeah that was, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't unmute. That's very helpful, Morgan. And yes, please do share that, um, that spreadsheet. That'll be, at least I'll try using it. Thank you. <laughs> and, and also, um, it's important to, to understand where you can make these comparisons at the 100 meter level, the really granular level, and where you might need to, to do comparisons at a, at a section level or to say, okay, between this point, this town and this town, this is where I'm going to compare the star ratings from the original survey with the, the new survey. So it doesn't always have to be at the 100 meter level, and that's important to, to understand. Uh, when you go in to do these reassessments. Mm, good point. Okay, thanks, Morgan. Um, we have, uh, before giving the, the, the mic to Liam, we have um, a question in the chat, Morgan, that says, uh, what were the most common road attributes that affected the star rating from Pima Lamo? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, Obviously, they're all important, all of the, the, the coding attributes. Uh, what we find generally is the, the ones that have the biggest impact are things like speeds, 
Um, also, um, the type of medium. So if you've got divided carriageways or if you've got a, a center line or if you've got uh, barriers, things like that. Curvature have, have a big impact, intersections. And obviously for uh, vulnerable road users, we're looking at where we've got flows and, and where we've got infrastructure. Um, so those, those would be the key one, but, but don't take away from the, the rest of them. They're, they're all very important. Um, and it's important to, to focus on all of them when you're doing the coding. Great, thanks, Morgan. And uh, Liam, uh, so there was, yeah, there was one on. more. The, the roadside roadside hazards are also play a huge role in the the star rating. So where we've got changes to barriers and where we've we've got changes to to what's happening on the roadside, that that also has a big impact on the star rating. Thanks so much, Morgan, for the clarification. Um, Liam, you had a question as well. Yeah, thanks, Morgan, for the presentation. Um, I just have a question about like what is produced in terms of the investment strategy. Do you do you, through after following the analysis, do you have a list of uh, treatments and then an understanding of how that changes the star rating? And then do you do a cost benefit analysis based on the the delta on the star rating versus the cost of various treatments, or is that not an appropriate way to uh, use the information? No, it, it is, and and for each of the assessments, we, I mean, the, the focus is is somewhat different. But as part of the the reassessment, you will obviously produce a, a a safer roads investment plan, the strip, and that can be used to to inform your investments going forward. So it's not just using the star ratings. Uh, the focus of this presentation was was really the star rating um, performance tracking. But obviously, one aspect that I haven't really talked much about is the fact that you also have um, the strip to inform your investments going forward. Uh, and it's a good point. Thanks for, for raising that one. And, and as part of that strip, we do obviously have the um, we, we do the economic analysis to see uh, just how how viable different treatments are, and, and we can rank based on that. So if you're looking at getting the best bang for your buck you're up you'll be able to use the strip um, of the reassessment to to inform your decisions going forward all right okay thank you well thank you morgan and thanks all the attendees to this eurorap lunchtime seminar um we are just in time to to finish uh today's meeting um, just for, for my information here, you can find uh, some data for contacting Morgan. All of our emails are usually name.lastname at irap.org, so it's easily um, something that you can remember easily. Here is my data. I'm happy to direct any questions or any further questions that you may have uh, to Morgan or to any other professional from IRAP. And it's been great to have you here. And as I, as I told you before, this, this meeting has been recorded. So we are happy to share this recording uh, when we process it with you so that you can revisit um, the session. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for your time and your great presentation. And we'll see you in the next uh, Eurorap Lunchtime Seminar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye.